I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. in your hymnal 304 not have I gotten but what I received I'm only a sinner saved by grace 304 let's stand together as we sing only a sinner saved by grace on that verse together not have I gotten but what I received grace has bestowed it since I have believed By the way, if you're a sinner, you're not saved any other way. It's only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, when you're saved by grace, to God be the glory. Because nothing we did. Uh, it's what he done for us. Amen? When he died on the cross. And uh, good to see you here tonight. Looking forward to a great service here together this evening. And let's bow together in prayer and ask God to meet with us. All right? Father, we thank you for another Sunday evening. Lord, many, many decisions I've made in my life through the years because I was in church on Sunday night. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for these who are back in their place on Sunday evening. Lord, we do lift up those unable with us tonight because they're ill. We pray your healing hand would be upon them tonight, Father. Raise them up to be back with us by Wednesday evening, the midweek service. Now, Father, we pray that you'll meet with us tonight. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for the decisions that were made for thee today. But, Lord, we need a fresh blessing tonight. Yes. And I pray that you'd meet with us. and. Our hearts would be open to what you would want to say to us. Use Brother Levine this evening. And Lord, uh, speak to us. And as he shares his burden, Lord, uh, may you speak to our hearts. Lord, we love you. We commit the service into your hands. Work in our lives, please. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated.
Bernard's alarmy. I am selfly sheltered here, protected by God's plan. Here the sun is always shining here, and not can harm me. I am safe forever in Beulahland. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulahland. On that last viewing, hear the works of God. Viewing, hear the works of God, I think, in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way his plan. Dwelling in the spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. See you now. I'm living underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm fishing on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Boy, that's good singing tonight. Now, we have a few announcements. Listen carefully, if you would, please. And uh, schedule this week now, Wednesday night, back here for our midweek service at 7 o'clock. Uh, Thursday night, uh, back down at the prison with the Reformers Unanimous. And uh, had, how we have, Bob? I don't remember, 30, 32, 35, something like that. There on Thursday night, five men received Christ their Savior. Uh, two of the men graduated the course, graduated the program, and it's exciting. We're also... The Lord, uh, through that conference we were at on Thursday, the uh, London uh, Correctional Facility, uh, the fellow wants uh, to meet with uh, a group, and he wants us. Uh, he wants a group there now. Uh, he's ready, whatever day, whatever time, whenever we can get guys there, he'll make it work. And uh, they're excited about us getting in at London. So uh, God's doing some good things there with the uh, RU Inside program. Friday night for Reformers Unanimous right here at the church. Then remember, Saturday evening will be the gospel concert with the Down East Boys right here. Uh, I'm pretty confident we're going to have a, a big crowd that night. And we're asking that our folks, uh, first of all, uh, come early. All right, and uh, you may not get a very good seat. And um, we're going to park on the other side of Kirk Williams in their parking lot over there and leave all our parking here for guests that come, okay? So just park there. It's not too bad of a walk. It's going to be a nice day. And uh, exercise will do us good, amen? And so we'll, we'll do that and leave this parking lot for our guests. We, we, it would be great if we had uh, two or three men that would make sure you're here no later than 5 o'clock and you would help park cars. Just, just get folks where they belong and uh, welcome them to the to the church and say good to see you here tonight and uh, open the door for them and give them a warm welcome. So if some of you fellows would take that upon yourself to be here and do that, that would be wonderful. Okay, uh, we want to take a minute and welcome our guests that are with us tonight. We're always glad when folks visit with us, especially on Sunday evening. And uh, if you're visiting tonight or if you have a guest with us, uh, I know Brother Pete, you're going to introduce these folks for us. Okay. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We. Amen. Good. To, good to have the Duttons here. I had met Brother Dutton at pastor school several times, and uh, it's good to see him here tonight with his wife. And glad that she's doing better. And great to have him in our service this evening. That's wonderful. And uh, he's been evangelism now for 12 years, did you say? 12 years preaching, and this is a preacher. And uh, I've heard a 
got, got a CD sometime. Did you give that to me, Brother Pete? Get a CD of some radio broadcasts you did, and I got to listen to that a little bit. And uh, he's a he's a good preacher, and uh, just talked to him for the service tonight here again, and renewed acquaintance. And uh, uh, he's going to preach for us next Sunday evening, and uh, you're going to enjoy hearing him preach, and uh, you'll you'll love that. All right. Anybody else tonight? First time, Courtney? Is this fellow new with you? He is, isn't he? All right. I said I had your peg there, man. And uh, tell us who he is. Jody? Cody. All right. Cody, good to have you tonight, man. Glad you're in church this evening. That's great. All right. Anyone else here tonight for the first time? Got a young man back here. Yes, sir. Your name is Rob? Good, good to have you. Rob from Columbus here? All right. Very good. Thanks for stopping in tonight, being in church on Sunday evening. We appreciate that. The usher is going to hand you a welcome card. If you all would be kind enough to fill out that welcome card, we sure would appreciate that. And a little bit, we have the offering, and you just drop that card in the plate, and we want you to keep the pen as our gift to you for coming this evening. All right, we're glad you're here. Let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we? All right, we have an anniversary to celebrate this evening. Bob and Kay Wallace, April 10th, 25 years of wedded bliss. And so have the Wallaces come up. We want to honor them tonight. And a great, great milestone. 25 years. No video. We're missing a chord. Is that right? Okay. He had a video to show on his laptop on the Tibetan Bible thing, and I guess we can't show it. Um, the good news is you can go online and watch it. Um, on your prayer card? Yeah, what is it? GodfreeTibet.com. I watched it this afternoon. It's a great vid great DVD. It's about 13 minutes long, and uh, you'll be blessed by seeing that. Man, that's, that's, I'm not pleased about that. Um, I don't know, apparently not. Apparently not. Apparently we should have started earlier looking for that. We thought it was here, but I guess it isn't. So, all right. Um, we're going to, Brother Levine, we were just going to show the video, so we're just going to go ahead and we'll uh, take a songbook. Let's sing together, all right? Turn over to number 272. You know what the good news is? We're on the winning side, all right? We're on the winning side. 272. Let's sing that together. Brother Bob? Let's sing that first together. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burdened down. I'm on the winning side Out in sin No more will I abide I've enlisted in the fight For the cause of truth and right Praise the Lord I'm on the winning side From the straight and narrow way I was drifting every day out upon the waters deep and wide, but it all is over now, glory light is on my brow, and my soul is on the winning side, well I'm on the winning side, yes I'm on the winning side, out 
alone in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. I will never have a fear, for my Lord is ever near. Five hundred twenty-three together. Five, two, three. I sought to flag to follow a cause for which to stand. Let's stand together once more as we sing. A flag to follow. Five, two, three. Together on that first. I sought a flag. another make somebody feel welcome especially our guests we'll come back and sing the last stanza together
I sought for satisfaction. Let's sing that last together. I sought for satisfaction, for yearning deep within. I sought for full deliverance from chains of guilt and sin. I sought for peace and pardon, for freedom from my fears. I sought a hope to cling to beyond these passing years. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath this flag, I'll take my stand and follow him today. All right, everybody said? Amen. Be seated, if you will. You ready to take our offering tonight? And uh, he found a chord. How about that? Praise the Lord. So he's going to set that up while you're giving. Okay? Take your time. Dig deep. He needs some time to set that up, all right? Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our uh, offering tonight. Brother Danny, we'll have you lead us, please. Had a good service today at the nursing home. Uh, Brother Wright said, and a uh, good, good crowd there, and uh, brought a good message, and uh, appreciate the folks who minister there in the nursing home uh, each Sunday. Brother Danny? Let's pray. Father, you are the way, the truth, and the life, Father, and your love is amazing, Father. It says you were wounded for our transgressions, you were bruised for our iniquities. Father, the chastisement of our peace was placed upon you. Oh, but with your stripes we are healed, Father. You are amazing, Lord. And I, I just to, 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 to be able to receive that love, Father. You gave, and gave your all, and I just pray that we would give back to you, Father. Help us to look past our own problems to the needs of others, Father. To give and not just take. And to, to offer instead of ask. And to, to be a blessing instead of just seeking a blessing, Lord. We love you, and we ask that you be with the rest of this service. Father, thank you for finding the cord, and we just ask uh, that, that uh, you be honored, and may you get all the glory and all the honor and all the praise and all the thanks for what's going to take place here tonight. And we say, ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
It's 6 a.m. As with every morning, the Tibetan people arrive by the hundreds to begin walking the circular pathway around the Bodha Stupa, an idol built around 500 AD, and today, one of Buddhism's most sacred sites. Under the shadow of the stupa, they offer prayers, prostrate themselves, burn incense on makeshift altars, spin prayer wheels, and perform rituals they believe will bring them good favor. Prayer flags of every color and the brightly painted temples surrounding the stupa stand in stark contrast to the reality that this is a religion that has kept its followers in spiritual darkness century after century. This area of Bodha is home to dozens of monasteries where the second son of every Tibetan family is sent, as young as eight years old, to study and to devote the rest of his life to the priesthood. But in this part of the world, the same devotion to Buddhism is passed to every member of the family. So much so, that for their entire life, virtually all Tibetans will perform the daily rituals and will carry a sacred string of beads with them everywhere they go. You just have this sense that the Buddhist religion encompasses all of their life here. Religion uh, is not just a part of their lives, really religion is their lives. It's an overwhelming thing to witness these people praying so sincerely and so devotedly to a God that does not exist. With an average elevation of 14,000 feet and the tallest peaks in the world, the Himalayan mountain range and the Tibetan plateau are home to a population of over six million Tibetans. Once known as the country of Tibet, the Tibetan Autonomous Region of Western China still boasts the largest number of Tibetan people. But today, major settlements can be found not only in the bordering Himalayan countries of Bhutan, Nepal, and India, but in Europe and even North America. Finding and traveling to the villages scattered throughout this area can be extremely difficult, even impossible during certain times of the year. As challenging as the terrain can be, however, the language barrier is an even bigger obstacle. Among the Tibetan people, there are dozens of different languages and dialects. Most of these have developed orally, which means that no written form of the local dialects exists. The one common thread among the Tibetan people is the classical Tibetan language. This language is not spoken among the people, but is intended for written materials only. The Tibetans have a great reverence for their written form in fact, they've preserved it over many generations, and their oral language has developed and evolved into something totally different. And because of the scattering of Tibetans all throughout the Himalayas, it creates all these different languages and dialects that are completely different, but their written form is intact. The problem with that is a lot of people are illiterate, so they don't know how to read the written form. Educated or not, the Tibetan people today are almost entirely unreached. 99% of all Tibetans are Buddhist, and with no solid churches and very little access to the word of God, that number is not likely to change. The vision of Worldview Ministries is to translate the scriptures for the planting of churches and the propagation of the gospel among the Tibetan people, wherever they can be found. There are between 80 and 100 dialects, languages and dialects. None of them have the whole Bible translated. A very few of them have a portion of scripture or perhaps some form of audio scripture. And our burden is to give them the printed word of God and see churches planted among them. We are right now in the process of planting a church right here in the city of Kathmandu, specifically to reach the Tibetan people. The decision to come to Christ is no small matter for a Buddhist. As with Islam, Religion and culture are so finely interwoven that the decision to turn one's back on Buddhism is made at great cost. I accepted Christ when I was 13 years old, but my family thought I just did not know what I was doing. Once they realized that I was serious about following Christ and would not worship the Buddhist idols, they began to reject me. Now I am not allowed to return home, and they try to cause problems for me. It is very difficult for anyone who turns to Christ from Buddhism. 
despite the inherent difficulty in making converts of the Tibetan people. The Great Commission is clear that we are to reach this needy population with the good news of the gospel, something that will be impossible without the word of God in a form that they can understand. You said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given. So we're asking for your wisdom throughout every day of this project. We recognize that none of this can be accomplished in human wisdom, for it's the Word of God we're dealing with. I'm incredibly privileged and just a great sense of God's provision and God's guidance in this project that He's brought together this team of people to begin this Bible translation for the Tibetan people. The need for a new translation is evident. The one currently in existence was done many years ago, and the language has changed so much since that time that even most educated people cannot understand it. Other significant problems with the translation make it ineffective for presenting the gospel. The translation they've had for years uses Buddhist terminology to represent Christian ideas. Uh, unfortunately for them, all that does is present Christianity with Buddhism rearranged, and that's all they can see is the Buddhist terms. The Worldview translation effort is based at Boda in Kathmandu and is under the direction of missionary translator Justin Levine. Together with missionary Luke Knickerbocker and native Tibetans, the work has already begun with the refining of their own skills in the Tibetan language. For a foreigner to learn Tibetan is quite challenging. If they have a phonetics course, they can, they're trained to hear those different sounds. Um, you have dental sounds and retroflex sounds, whereas in English we have alveolar sounds. So you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but uh, to describe they have ta ta da da ta ta da da Those are all different sounds um, used in Tibetan and Nepali. And uh, you have to be able to hear those sounds and reproduce those sounds to give an accurate meaning. The language is not only unique phonetically, but grammatically as well. Figuring out how to carry intended meanings from one language to another is always the most difficult task in translation. But Tibetan is even more peculiar than most. The way it's structured is very difficult to bring the same ideas from English or from Greek. Uh, for instance, the Tibetan verbs. Uh, their verb system, every verb is marked either volitional or non-volitional. I chose to do it or I accidentally did it. Uh, one example of a problem with that, with the scriptures, is did Jesus accidentally fall asleep on the boat with the disciples, or did he intend to fall asleep on the boat with the disciples? And that type of issue even has doctrinal bearings because it could be that if he meant to fall asleep, he was teaching his disciples a lesson. If he accidentally fell asleep, there may not be that, that teaching. Those kinds of challenges mean that uh, not only are we required to have expertise, training, a deep understanding of the Tibetan language, but also the translation team is required to have the leading of the Holy Spirit. This work is impossible without God's Holy Spirit leading and guiding for those kinds of challenges. With proven practices in place based on ongoing worldview translation work in Uganda and India, a thorough process of word testing, translating, checking and editing has now begun. Our hope is that through the translated Word of God in the Tibetan language, that Tibetan churches will be started all throughout China, Nepal, and India, wherever the Tibetans are, and that they will turn to Christ. Uh, in, in, in the history of Tibetans, there really never has been a response to the gospel, and that's what we hope to see. There are many people who have come to work with the Tibetan people but it is always temporary because they try to reach my people with very little knowledge of the language and culture. I am happy to see this ministry being so serious about reaching the Tibetan people. The long-term goal of reaching Tibetan people is obviously giving a Bible into each of the dialects that they speak. Now, our plan to do that is to translate into the written classical Tibetan that they have, and that can be read and understood by any Tibetan who is educated. Our hope is, after we translate the classical Tibetan, translating into the various dialects will be a lot easier and just kind of a modification of the classical Tibetan translation. William Cameron Townsend once made the statement, the greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue. 
it needs no furlough and is never considered a foreigner. In the same way an American Christian is nourished by reading his English translation of the Bible rather than struggling to understand ancient Greek and Hebrew texts, the unreached, Tibetans in particular, will respond to God's word when it is in their own heart language. It means much more when it is in their language. They can understand what it is really saying. Otherwise, they do not accept it. They think it is not meant for them. I met with a man recently in a different country. As we discussed with him the possibility of translating the Bible into his language, his eyes lit up. The joy of his heart was just overflowing. And he made this statement to us, why does God allow other peoples to have his word in their language and for so long my people do not have it? It takes some time for us to think about and imagine what life would be like if we never had God's word, what our culture would be like, what our mindset would be like, what our worldview would be. Uh, and these people are living in such spiritual darkness, having never been able to read the word of God in their own language. I had the joy of being a pastor for 16 years, and there are many great joys in pastoral ministry, but some of the greatest joys I've ever had have come in the work of Bible translation. I believe in one way or another, every Christian should be involved in the propagation of God's Word to those who do not have it. We have the Great Commission, the command to see churches planted and believers discipled. That's not possible without the printed Word of God. What I would like to see happen is a great awareness, a revival of awareness among our churches to see the Word of God translated for unreached peoples. There's a deep conviction that there's a greater thing ahead when we can hand the Tibetan Bible to the people, see Tibetan souls saved, see Tibetan churches started, and one day see Tibetan people at the throne of God rejoicing and glorifying God because of this translation project. This morning, millions of Tibetans faithfully worship the only gods they know. Tomorrow, they will do the same. And the day after that. And the day after that. You can make the difference. Will you help us introduce them to the Savior? Please join us in reaching the Tibetan people with God's Word. you have for Brother Levine? We we'll take a minute and ask to answer any questions you might have about the, the project there. Um, he's right. They, they have a translation of the Bible. They used many Buddhist terms and, you know, Jesus Christ is not just another God on the shelf. He's got to be the only God on the shelf. And uh, he's not just one of the many gods. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and they need to know who he is. <clears throat> so that's... Um, great project we, we support the knickerbockers as you know uh and they're involved in this project and um uh working now well by the way we have brother olashay coming the end of may you'll get a chance to meet him and have him uh here in our church as well uh anybody have a question scotty uh, mainly we <laughs> eat rice and lentil soup with kind of some gravy, vegetable gravy together. And we always eat with our hands, but, but typically they eat with their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, chopsticks, we don't do much of those, just hand. Yes, Even soup, just hand. <laughs> Anthony? Real good and loud, use your man voice. <laughs> Yes, translation still has its challenges, and I'll address some of those in a little bit. Okay. Very good. Yeah, Brother Danny? Yeah. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. They are very open to listen. They like new ideas. They like to discuss. They're really open to dialogue. Now, they're also, um, but they're not apt to change. That's a, a been a slow process. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, Quentin. Um, yes, not to us personally, not as of yet, but our church congregation, every single one of our church members are first generation Christians. And that means all of them came from Buddhist families. So a lot of them have experienced persecution. And even the guy in the video, Dawa, he's my best friend. And his brother was so frustrated with his faith, his Christian faith, that he said if he ever returned to the village, that he said that he's going to break his leg. And there's those kinds of threats. And one lady, um, she got baptized, but her family said, if you get baptized, you're never allowed to come back home. But she went through with it anyway. So. Amen. Yeah. That's good. And of the 7 million or whatever uh, Tibetans, how many, how many independent Baptist missionaries are there there? Uh, there's three. That you're aware of? Three. Three, yeah. three for seven million people. Yes. That's, uh, and and that's if you include um, the ethnic Tibetan people, we work with ethnic Tibetans too. It's more like 25 million wow. in a very large, huge area of the world, mm -hmm. just completely neglected. Wow. That's amazing. All right. Um, let's do this. We're going to, I want to take an offering for him and for the. Tibetan Bible Project, all right? So, so I, well, here's what I wanted to do, okay? Um, Miss Levine, you're going to sing. I want you to sing, and they'll, they'll take the offering while you're singing, okay? And then when she's done singing, Brother Levine's going to come preach for us, okay? So, fellas, you get ready. You come. Set that, make sure it's turned screen for you. All right, you got it, fellas? Imagine, as I said this morning, just imagine if, you know, we, you, you who did I see? Who, Cheryl Polable, you leave your Bible here, you have a church Bible, because I see it sitting on your chair during the week, because she has another Bible at home, probably several other Bibles at home, like most of us do, and you can choose what Bible to have. Can you imagine if you didn't have a Bible? None, nothing to read, nothing to learn about God how privileged we are but to whom much is given much is required and uh, we, we owe uh, to, to get the gospel to these folks and to give them the word of God amen and uh, let's be generous in our offering to these folks tonight and for the work God's called them to do alright Father we thank you for the privilege to give and I pray Lord your blessing on our offering tonight thank you for what is being done getting the word of God to these Tibetan people Thank you for men and women who are surrendering their lives to get the job done. Lord, help us to do our part to keep them there and to further the work of translating the Word of God into their heart language. Bless this offering, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Speaking to the crowd, a beggar came who fell down before Christ and called out his name. The disciples quickly came and they turned the man away. He was just a senseless father till they heard the Savior say, Love as I loved, give as I gave. These 
here. <laughs> it's just such a, a blessing to be here this evening. And we, we actually just got back from Nepal, uh, I don't know, a few days ago. It's only been probably not even two weeks uh, since we got back. So now is our basically our first time on the road. So we're really excited to share what with God is doing among the Tibetan people. And we are making some progress. And uh, we, they said in the video that we're starting a, a church specifically among the Tibetan people. And uh, we had that, and it's going really well. God has built a, a solid core group of believers. And uh, like I said, the, they're all first-generation Christians. Um, the, the lower Tibetan people, there's uh, only first-generation Christians. There's no such thing as a second-generation Christian. They say there's about 25 Christians. That's all there is, 25. So there's more in this room this evening than there are Loa Tibetan believers worldwide. So that just kind of illustrates what we're up against. And I had a really good question this evening about translation. You know, how many languages can you learn to help you translate better? Well, each one that you learn does help you understand language better, but sometimes translation is really difficult. Uh, you guys ever play with Lincoln Logs? Any play, play with Lincoln Logs? No. What about Legos? Legos. Yeah. Legos. Um, what about Connects? Anyone? Yeah? Connects? You guys know what those things are? OK, now those are three different kinds of toys, right? I'm just trying to explain this the simplest I can. OK, so you have Legos and Lincoln Logs and Connects. And they kind of, you can build practically anything that you want, right, with those materials. So with Connects, just imagine building a Ferris wheel out of Connects. Anyone ever do that? Ferris wheel, yeah. So what about Legos? Building a Ferris wheel out of Legos. 
Sounds a little bit more challenging, right? What about Lincoln Logs? Try to build a Ferris wheel out of Lincoln Logs. Can you do it? No. You're going to have to import some kind of foreign objects to get that thing to work. And see, that's how languages work a lot of times. When it comes to translation, you try to build the same idea, the same shape, with a different kind of system. And sometimes that system doesn't always line up like you like it to. There was an uh, illustration in the video about Tibetan volitional verbs. Did Jesus accidentally fall asleep on the ship, or did he intentionally fall asleep? Those are some of the issues that we face. Um, think about, in, in Tibetan they have honorifics, which means there's five different ways you can respect someone. You can disrespect them, just kind of back and forth respect, and then really great respect, different levels. Five different levels. Okay? Now, which level did Jesus use to the devil? Was it, which level? Was it the highest one? No. Was it the lowest one? Probably. Okay, what about the devil to Jesus? How did that work? Did he respect Jesus? Did he kind of respect? Or? Yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. There's not always an exact answer right away. What about Jesus when he was talking to his disciples? Did he greatly respect them? Did he disrespect them? Which of the five levels? What about the disciples to Jesus? How was that? Did they respect him? Too much respect shows distance, but they were close. So you have to figure that one out. And uh, volition, the vi video mentioned volition. That's whether someone does something on accident or on purpose. So what about falling? Is falling something you do on accident or you do on purpose? <laughs> well, in Tibetan, there's two, di two different verbs, two different ones, and it's one or the other. Okay. So what about 2 Samuel 4, uh, 4, 4, where Mephibosheth ends up falling on the ground and becoming lame? Was that on accident or on purpose? That was an accident, right? But think about Saul when he fell on his sword. Which is that? That was on purpose, right? You don't want to mess that one up. Change the whole entire story. Now, what about in Revelation when John... He falls as dead in uh, chapter 1, verse 17. He falls as dead. Was that on accident or was it on purpose? Ooh, that one's up for debate, I think. <laughs> and uh, there's also inclusivity, which we have first person plural, inclusive and exclusive, which means we, I'm not including the audience, us, or we. There's two different words there. You have to pick. So what about Romans 5.8? But God commendeth his love toward us or us. Which one is that? That one's pretty obvious, isn't it? Unless you're a certain style of belief, <laughs> then you might be exclusive. Uh huh. So you've got to be careful with what, what word you're choosing. And what about the disciples on the, on the ship? And they say, carest thou not that we perish or we perish? Which one is that? That one's probably up for debate too. But you see, translation is not always easy. Doesn't matter how much Greek you know, doesn't matter how many languages you know, there's some things that are just challenging. So please pray for us that God would give us wisdom and the Holy Spirit's guidance on how to make these choices. They're not easy choices. Um, so we're going to be looking in the scripture tonight in 2 Chronicles chapter number 34. Pastor, what time do you guys get out of here? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll go and see what happens. 2 Chronicles chapter number 34. Say, what's this guy, where is this guy going? I never heard a missionary preach at a Chronicles. <laughs> well, you'll find out. 
We're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter number 34. And we, I hope to bring an idea to you, Scripture, and kind of really drive home um, this idea. So we'll start reading in verse number 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. So we're going to be looking this evening at the life of Josiah and the story behind his life. And so let's go ahead and begin our message in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for the freedom that you've given to us to gather, to assemble in this place. Bless every single one that has come. And I pray that you would just help me as I preach your word. Give me your words and not my own. And I and will praise you for everything that you're going to do this evening. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So King Josiah, you say he's a good king or a bad king. What's the Bible say? He's a good king. What about his father? You guys ever studied the kings? King uh, Josiah's father was King Ammon. And if you jump back a little bit in verse 21 of chapter 33, it says Ammon was uh, 22 years old when he started reigning. And he, reigned, he only reigned two years. That's pretty short, right? I think that's the shortest or one of the shortest reigns. And you know what happened? He was actually very evil and he didn't humble himself before the Lord. And if we look in verse 24, his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. He was killed in his own house. So think about this. You got this uh, guy. He's 22. He reigns for two years only. He's so wicked, so evil, so corrupt. His own servants conspire and they murder him. And then he has an eight-year-old son who takes his place and becomes king. So that's why King Josiah is so young. He's only eight years old. Okay, think about this too. If, if King Josiah is eight and his father is 24 when, he's di when he died, how old was King Ammon when he had his son? 16 years old. So you have this teenage father. And King Manasseh, he was reigning, and I think he was trying to maybe turn back his son, his grandson, but he had the, the whole land was so evil and so corrupt. And then King Josiah is just a little boy, and his father is murdered into his, in his own house. And then he gets placed right into the kingdom as a young boy. But... Look at verse number three. It says, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, speak after the God of David's father. So there's some interesting wording here, and I think it's important to observe. It says that he began to seek after God. Does it say that, hey, he found God? Hey, he started worshiping God or what do we say? He, it's just the wording. It says he began to seek after God. He didn't find him. Where was he? He's looking for him. When he's, what, how old is he? If, he's, if it's the eighth year into his reign, he started his reign at eight years old. I'm going to do a little bit of math here tonight. Sixteen years old. So he's 16. He's looking for God. Wouldn't you, if you had this evil past, your father's murdered, your grandfather was evil. You're coming in. You're looking for something different. You know what? People these today, they're looking for something different. They don't want this corruption. They don't want this evil. They want to get out of that. They're looking. They're seeking. And King Josiah, he was in the same boat. And what does, what's the first thing that King Josiah does? It says in the 12th year... He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. 
he cut down the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He broke in pieces and made dust of them and stored it upon the graves of them, sacrificing them. He burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even into Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And uh, when he had broken down the altars and the groves and beaten down the gra graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Next thing it says, now in the 18th year of his reign. Okay. So he started this campaign in the 12th year of his reign, and it lasted until he was in the 18th year, so six years. From when he's 20 to 26 years old, the first thing that he does is what? He goes into the land and gets rid of all the idols, right? Sounds, is that a good thing to do? I think that's a good thing to do. Now, let's bring it back here to America. What happens if we go into America and we destroy all the idols of the land? What happens if we start putting out good legislation? What happens if we make abortion illegal? Now, does making new legislation, getting rid of things, banning things, here's the question. Does that or would that change the heart, hearts of people? Would that change the hearts of the people? When you take stuff away and you throw laws at them, those laws, are they good? Yeah, those would be great laws. But does that change the heart? Does, does the law, does those laws change the heart? No. no. So this is, this is man's religion. Man's religion often works the same way. We come up with things, don't eat this, uh, don't do this on Thursdays, that's bad. And we have all these rules and regulations that all the religions of the world are just like that. Do this, don't do that. Of our own ideas. But that just doesn't line up with, it doesn't change the heart. Getting rid of the idols, I'm sure that those people in, in Manasseh, he tried to repent in the later years of his life, Josiah's grandfather. But what did the people do? They would not repent. Even though the king tried to repent, the people would not. And he got these same people just a few years, two years later, three years later, coming back. Do you think they're going to change because you broke down their stuff? You go down to the bar, you burn the bar down, you think that's going to make people stop drinking? No. No. They're just going to find a new place. So he goes in the six-year campaign, and in the 18th year of his reign, in verse 8, he gets these people together to do what? To repair the house of the Lord his God. So the next thing he does, first thing in the campaign, he wipes out all the idols of the land. Next thing he does is he starts to repair the house of the Lord his God. Is that a good thing? I would say that's good. Good start. You're trying to make the, the house of God beautiful. You're trying to renovate the house of God and make it look so beautiful and maybe stained glass windows, I don't know. And it's just so beautiful. Does a beautiful building does that change the hearts of people? <laughs> Do they say, wow, look at that building. I'm going to worship God now. Does that change their heart? No. no. You know, there's a lot of really, really beautiful Catholic churches in America. They're beautiful. Architecturally speaking, they're so big and beautiful and sound and and they're old, they have these paintings. But you know what? A lot of them are empty. There's, there, the, the presence of God is not in there. A beautiful building is not going to change people's hearts. Same thing with religion. You, go, you come and visit us in Nepal, and you can visit some of these monasteries, and they are elaborate. 
You got these people living in small, little, little places, so inconvenient. And then these huge temples with gold and ornate paintings. And it's so beautiful to look at. But you know what? It's empty. Empty religion. So anyways, King Josiah, he is trying to seek after God. He's trying to do what's right. But thankfully, what happens in this chapter, chapter 34? So they go into the house of the Lord. They, uh, they apparently haven't been using it. It needs repair. In verse 14 it says, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. So they go in, and what do they find? What's the law of God? That's the word of God, the Bible. So all this time, King Josiah has been reigning and ruling without the guidance of the word of God. He was a king without the word of God. They were essentially a people without the word of God. Trying to do what's best, trying to do what's right, but essentially, they do not, do not have the Word of God. But they found it. They got it. It's in their own language and everything. It's just somehow buried in the temple. They hadn't got out and hadn't gotten it out and read it. Maybe that's some of us. Where's our Bible at? Is it hidden somewhere in some temple? We're neglecting it there. Even though we have the Bible in our own language. That would be a shame, really. There's over 7,000 languages spoken in the world today. And between four and 500 of them have the completed word of God in their language. So be thankful that you have the word of God and you can read it. But anyways, the, the priest, he passes along the word of God and he gives it to the king. And he has, and the king, it gets read to the king. What is the king's reaction? It's very interesting. Verse 19, it says, And it came to pass, when the king had heard that the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. This is a little bit unusual. The first time that he is presented with the law of God, the word of God, the Bible, he rips his clothes. Now, what is that in Jewish custom? What does that mean? Yeah? What else? Mourning or repentance, grieving, sorrow, all those things. So he is upset. The king is upset after hearing the word of God. That's a little bit unusual. Isn't King Josiah a good king? Right? If he's a good king, then once he reads the Bible, don't you think he'd be like, oh yeah, we're all good, we're all set. We've got the idols taken care of, house of God, renovation project, in action. No. That was not his response. His response was one of repentance. Because here's the thing. You can try to be good. You can try to look good. All those things. You can try to do all those things. And you can think that you're good. But when you compare your goodness and your righteousness and your holiness with the holiness of God, you realize something. You realize that your holiness doesn't line up with God's holiness. Your righteousness does not line up with God's righteousness. And King Josiah, he was humbled when he found out how holy God is. Wow, this is the God that I've been seeking for? This is who he is? This is his holiness? And he tears his clothes in repentance and sorrow. Wow, we are so backslidden. Our people are so backslidden. Whatever we've been trying to do isn't good enough. So King Josiah, he repents. When? When? 
When the idols were broken up, torn up? No. When, when the house of the Lord was being beautified? No. It was when he saw, heard the law of God. You see, there is power in the word of God. There is power in this book. And what happened later on? Not only King Josiah repented, but the whole kingdom. They repented. And they made a covenant to do all those things that were in the book after they heard it too. And they did, so up until King Josiah passed away. And that was the power of what? Good policies, good legislation, a nice building. No. It was by the power of the law of God, by the power of the word of God. And I think that there are so many people in this world today, it's, sad, it's a sad fact that so many people do not have the law of God. They do not have the word of God in their own language. And we expect to just go in there as missionaries and without the word of God and expect them to repent, to have the same reaction. They need to hear the word of God. It's by the word of God that they will be converted. And it is my hope and my desire to see the Tibetan people have the word of God presented to them and say, hey, here, here's the word of God in your language. You can read it. And you know what? I bet we're going to see some of the same reactions as King Josiah did. Because I, like I told you, some people are fed up with the evil of this world. They're fed up with the corruption. They're seeking. They want to know who God is. And they can find out if they can just know and they can read the law of God. So please pray for the Tibetan people. And, and it's not just the Tibetan people. There's people all around the world that do not have access to the word of God in their own language. And how, like Pastor was saying, how many Bibles do we have on our shelves? I know we have a number. What are we doing to reach the unreached? God help us. Let's pray. Dear my Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to speak your word. Thank you of the testimony of King Josiah. He did not have a hard heart, but he was looking for you, looking to know who you were, looking to see. And when he found out your holiness, he repented. And that's what we're hoping, that through the presentation of the law of God, that people will know who you are and they will turn from their sin and turn towards you. So I pray that you would just help us to all understand these these facts and the situation of the world it's, it's lost and in darkness please Lord will you just speak to our hearts this evening and we'll thank you for it in Jesus name let's keep our heads bowed for just a moment please <clears throat> the power of the word of God the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the Bible says we're born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever it's the word of God that brings salvation it's the word of God that changes people's lives you have lost loved ones you have people you, you, who are close to you people who live near you people you work with that need the gospel we have the gospel we have the Word of God. If you're trying to figure out some nice story to tell them or some way to talk to them, just give them the Word of God and let the Word of God do the work. It will convert the soul. Well, that's good. It's good, but it's the Bible that made the difference, the reading of the law of God. It'll make the difference in your life and in my life as well. I want to give you opportunity if God has spoken to your heart this evening. 
Maybe you're not seeing in your life what you'd like to see in your life. Well, then I ask you, how are you doing with your Bible reading? How are you doing with your Bible study? How are you doing with your Bible memorization and meditation? And what are we doing? Each of us individually ask, what am I doing to get the Word of God to people who have none? What am I doing to get the Word of God to people who do not have the Word of God? And then be willing to ask the Lord, what will you have me to do? What do you want me to do, God? If God has spoken to your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Him, and the altar will be open. Father, I pray you bless this invitation now. Lord, I thank you for the message this evening. Thank you for the heart, both Brother Levine and his wife, and for the ministry that you've called them to. May you prosper that work. May you breathe upon those men as they translate the Scriptures. Give them wisdom from on high. And Lord, I pray that we'll live, if you tarry your coming, we'll live to see the day of fruit coming from a Tibetan Bible. Now, Father, bless this invitation. May people respond to what you're telling them to do in their heart. May holy decisions be made for you this evening. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. She plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. And God has spoken to your heart this evening. Then respond to him tonight and use the altar, please. Oh, to That's right. Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. about Dwight Moody and his group when he would go to England and they would hold meetings in England and in those days they would hold they actually held atheist meetings in the afternoons and they would have thousands of professing atheists or agnostics attend the meeting you say what in the world would they say to them they would give them the word of God they would challenge those men to read the Gospel of John. That's all he would say. Challenge, I want you to go home and read the Gospel of John. Because John says these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And as they read the Word of God, God got a hold of their heart. And many were saved because of that. Not because of some great preacher or some great personality but because of the word of God 
Bible Baptist Church is still going 60 years later because it's always had somebody preach the Word of God. And that's the secret right there. And uh, stick with the book and let's get the Word of God to as many as we can. Amen? Amen? That's good. Brother Lamine, mean, thank you. Praise the Lord. That was great. All right. Well, we're going to pray and we'll let you get going tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, don't forget. Uh, be back Wednesday night for the midweek service. We've got a special treat for you tonight. Brother Linke found uh, a great deal on Cheryl's cookies. Do you know, have you ever had Cheryl's cookies? I had not had one until he got those. Now I've had more than one. I'm not, I know. Is my wife in here? Uh-oh, here she is, yeah. I think they want you in the nursery, dear, but, uh, you yeah. Uh oh. Um, so when you leave tonight, he's going to give you a, a cookie. All right. And uh, you will enjoy that. I'm telling you. And uh, it is uh, delicious. Excellent. All right. Listen, let's pray together. Shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the wonderful service here tonight. Lord, I'm rejoicing, and yet my heart is so heavy over people that are so sincere and sincerely wrong God forgive us for being so content that we have the truth and so apathetic that they don't have it and God I'm thanking you tonight for a church that is concerned about getting the gospel to the ends of the earth is interested in fulfilling the great commission of getting the gospel to every creature. God, I pray that you would continue to stir us up to get the gospel to every creature in the world. Lord, thank you for this evening now. Thank you for each one who's made their way here. Dismiss us with your care, please. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You're dismissed.